A injeção de aerossóis na atmosfera é uma tentativa desesperada para arrefecer o clima. No passado fomos confrontados com duras escolhas. Tivemos de evoluir para um sistema alimentar à base de algas e vegetais, muitos deles criados in vitro, de um dia para o outro. As nossas casas são flexíveis, facilmente construídas e transformadas, ideais para os novos nómadas como eu. Vejo o meu filho de três em três meses. Vivo num lugar seguro com os avós, protegido deste vai vem que é o meu dia a dia. A recente guerra da água deixou marcas difíceis de apagar. Chamo-me Lucas e faço missões numa base militar espacial. Less than 100 years ago, we were 2.5 billion. In 2077, we will be 10 billion. And we will realize that in 150 years, the population will have more than tripled. There will be 3 billion more people than today, most of those in developing countries. This will increase the pressure on energetic resources and needs. If the current rate of consumption continues, by 2050, we will need 60% more food, 40% more water and 50% more energy. Since we have already exhausted 80% of the planet's freshwater resources, deforested 40% of the Earth's surface, and released 23 gigatons of carbon a year, what are the prospects for the next 60 years? How do we reconcile the growing need for energy with the need to preserve the planet? Only an energetic revolution will do. L'espérance de vie était relativement limitée. Donc euh, jusque euh, en Europe, euh, euh, au milieu du XVIIIe siècle, euh, c'était moins de 35 ans. Et puis nous avons eu la chance de découvrir les combustibles fossiles. Ce schéma-là, nous le savons aujourd'hui, il n'est pas soutenable durablement. Je ne crois pas que les énergies renouvelables seront suffisantes à assurer les besoins énergétiques. Et donc il nous faut trouver en complément donc, une énergie possible Et je pense qu'il n'y a pas d'autre source sur le long terme que les énergies nucléaires. Voilà. Et donc c'est pour cela que la fusion est porteur de si grand espoir. In the south of France, the most ambitious and groundbreaking energy project for the future, ITER, is being built. The European Union, the USA, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea and India are working together to create fusion energy which is the artificial reproduction of the phenomenon that powers the sun and stars, creating enormous amounts of energy in a clean and safe way. It reunit 35 pays, qui représente près de la moitié de la population mondiale. C'est le plus grand projet scientifique. The ultimate energy source of the universe is fusion power. The power of the sun, the power of the stars, using hydrogen to burn cleanly with no nuclear waste, to create energy. That's how Mother Nature does it. Un gramme d'hydrogène qui fusionne, c'est comme si instantanément vous faisiez brûler 8 tonnes de pétrole. Think of it. Unlimited energy from seawater. We can extract hydrogen, then heat the hydrogen, implode the hydrogen to create energy in the ITER fusion reactor. Nous espérons que les premières expériences réelles de puissance de fourniture d'énergie de fusion aux alentours des années 2035. Et donc, je n'espère pas que l'on puisse construire une première installation industrielle avant 2050. Ma conviction profonde, c'est que cette technologie se substituera à la technologie de fission. Until we achieve fusion energy and in the face of growing energetic needs, the only short-term alternative is to build more nuclear-efficient plants than nuclear energy as we know it. China is building 28 new nuclear power plants in addition to the existing 500 in the world, although the United States suspended the construction of reactors and Germany phased out all plants after the accident in Fukushima. Fission energy is effective but raises crucial issues for future generations. When you split apart the uranium atom, a process called fission, you get energy. That's the energy of the Hiroshima bomb, the Nagasaki bomb. But when you split the atom, you get waste, tremendous amounts of waste. In a nuclear power plant core, one third 
One third of that core becomes high level nuclear waste every year. In the United States, we have 100 commercial nuclear power plants. We are 70 years into the nuclear age, and we still don't know what to do with nuclear waste. And how long is it radioactive? Some of it is radioactive for millions of years. Well, what about putting it underground? That's safe, right? Well, Yucca Mountains in Nevada was supposed to be the site for American nuclear waste. Guess what happened? They had to close it down. So many problems. It's like 25 kilometers around and five kilometers down, and they are burying their nuclear waste there. They've sealed off the site, and they have to put signs on that site to communicate with the future, to tell the humans of the future not to dig there, not to build there, because the site is toxic. Now, nuclear waste lasts at least 7,000 years as in terms of its toxicity. The oldest culture to whom we have a relationship is the Egyptians, and that's 5,000 years. And we have great difficulties decoding their language. So how do we communicate to post-humans 7,000 years from now? NASA has a team. They have archaeologists, philosophers, historians, science fiction writers, linguists. They've got huge teams of people working on the notion, how do we communicate with human 7,000 years from now to, to, to protect them from the results of our industrial revolution, nuclear waste. When you go back 10,000 years, we had an ice age. That area was under ice. North America was under a half a mile of ice during the ice age. When that water melted, it created gigantic lakes like the Great Lakes, Salt Lake, and water dissolves and will corrode these canisters. So forget about storing nuclear waste for 10,000 years. We're talking about millions of years. And at the present time, there is no known technology known to humankind that can isolate nuclear waste for millions of years. Finalmente conseguimos tirar partido do enorme poder energético do Sol. No espaço, há painéis gigantes a enviar energia solar para a Terra. If harnessed in its entirety, the solar energy the Earth receives in a single day would meet the planet's energy needs for a year. In space, there is eight times that amount of energy. In the long-term future, the Sun will remain as a source of energy hope for humanity. Currently, it's, uh, uh, there's people researching it. I think it's probably a few decades off, but you can imagine that uh, beginning with power for activities in space and eventually perhaps uh, transmitting it to Earth could be a revolutionary capability later this century. To put a pound of anything in orbit around the Earth costs about $10,000. Now imagine thousands of gigantic solar panels in outer space beaming energy down to the planet Earth. Is that possible? Yes. Definitely possible. Is it economic? Not now. Well, if you look at space solar power as the solution to our environmental uh, problems, then I would caution you not to put the hope into this. I think the real question is we should make sure that we burn less and less fossil fuels now because climate change is real. Uh, climate change is something that is one of the biggest threats that, uh, that we have at the global scale. History shows that replacing one fuel source with another takes 50 years on average. This is an additional responsibility for us. The transition to renewable energy must be hastened. The problem with talking about moving to wind and solar power is today, between them, they're producing only 1.5% of our energy. 80% is still from oil, gas and coal. Coal is the big killer in terms of climate change. It's also the big villain in terms of air pollution. A energia verde é uma energia de futuro. E quem tem que estar preocupado são aqueles que baseiam as suas economias na exploração de petróleo. 
Eu acho que é claro hoje que os países que apostarem nas tecnologias que são sustentáveis do ponto de vista ambiental são os países cujas economias no futuro serão as mais dinâmicas e serão as que garantirão uma maior prosperidade aos seus próprios cidadãos. Eu acho que aí é uma das grandes vantagens da Europa em relação ao todo o resto do mundo. Não é? Nós somos líderes nas energias renováveis e, e Portugal e a Europa estão à frente nessa revolução energética. Mas o mar pode ser uma alternativa incrível para o setor energético. Aliás, grande parte da energia eólica que é produzida na Europa já é produzida no offshore e, portanto, e muito mais será no futuro. A Comissão Europeia entende que, a partir de 2030, haverá mais energia eólica offshore do que energia eólica onshore gerada na Europa. The difficulty is there's no simple solution. It's got to be a mixture of things and we could save a lot of energy while also saving money. It's very easy to say that that people don't do it. Often because the individual amounts of saving are very small, so it's not worth doing it. So for that reason we need regulation. Maybe the, the best thing that we can do on the policy side is to put a tax on carbon dioxide. If we made it really expensive to use fossil fuels, then this would speed up the change. Se houver políticas adequadas, é perfeitamente possível conter as alterações climáticas. E essa deve ser a nossa prioridade. Não é sofrer os efeitos das alterações climáticas e depois tentar remediar no plano das migrações ou da economia ou do ambiente. China is one of very few countries in the world where uh, environmental considerations are driving energy policy. Because of the air pollution is so bad, there have been demonstrations in the street that people are forcing the government to move to some cleaner energy. And the Chinese are building colossal amounts of renewable energy. On the other hand, they're still building coal power. So there's a tension between uh, giving people enough energy to have decent lives and giving clean energy to give a decent planet. And this is the tension we have to learn to resolve. In the 20th century, we underwent the transition from the production economy to the consumer economy. The Industrial Revolution has made possible the suppression of the scarcity of goods. But as the quantity produced became greater than necessary, we came up with marketing to create consumer needs. Today, we are experiencing the side effects of this transition. We have created a system of infinite growth that is incompatible with the sustainability of the planet. The great challenge of the 21st century is to restore the balance. We have only one way left, smart growth in the way we produce, consume and feed. In 2050, nós sabemos que vamos ter de alimentar 10 mil milhões de pessoas. Nós vamos precisar pelo menos de mais 30% de proteínas do que aquelas que nós produzimos hoje em dia. Essas proteínas alimentares não podem continuar a vir todas da agricultura, nem das explorações, digamos assim, das indústrias alimentares terrestres. Porquê? Porque essas indústrias são altamente carbonizantes, ou seja, um quilo de carne de vaca existe 9 quilos de feno e 9 quilos de feno exigem 900 litros de água para serem produzidos. Mas o sistema de food system e a agricultura não podem for é 20 a 30% da greenhouse gas emission. Yes, beef emits lots of carbon uses, and lots of water, and lots of let's say, energy. Se começarmos cada vez mais a pensar numa alimentação uh, baseada em espécies que até absorvam carbono, como os bivalves, por exemplo, ou as algas, nós conseguimos contribuir para a descarbonização do planeta ou produzir espécies que absorvam o carbono que da atmosfera é depositado no mar. Throughout life, each of us consumes more than 1 million and 500,000 watts of energy, 100,000 tons of water, and wastes more than 13 tons of food. Despite the decline in natural stocks, we throw away 5,400 Olympic swimming pools worth of fish every year, while 800 million people go to bed hungry. 800 million people are suffering from hunger, 
two billion people suffers from micronutrients deficiency, so-called hidden hunger, and two billion people suffers from overweight obesity. So our food system is not sustainable. In this world, just the amount of food wastage that happens in the United States and Europe is sufficient to feed the world three times over. 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted every year. One third of the food is just thrown away. One of the greatest consequences of the digital revolution and globalization altogether has been we're in a world of abundance. There's a dark side to abundance. And the consumer economy was oriented around overcoming the scarcity of physical stuff. Well, we've actually solved that problem. Stuff is no longer scarce. Now we have to deal with the consequences of that abundance. And so redefining economies so that there's less physical waste is, is one of the great challenges. as economias que vão dominar a economia do século XXI, que vai ser a bioeconomia e a economia circular. A economia circular no sentido de reduzir o consumo e a exploração de recursos naturais, portanto a ideia de que nós vamos reciclar o que são os resíduos de uma indústria para ser a fonte e a matéria-prima de outra indústria. And I think 3D printing can, can play a big role in, in that. I think we can hopefully save the planet by being much more sustainable with uh, our transportation, with the way we uh, manufacture products, less waste, uh, local production, taking out transportation uh, makes much more sense. Like if I need a product, why does it need to come all the way from China when it can be made right here, maybe in Amsterdam? Hoje vivemos numa economia Star Trek. Só produzimos aquilo de que necessitamos. O que está a acontecer e dá-me alguma esperança é que as novas gerações, os chamados millennial, já quase que por instinto têm uma compreensão que têm de ter uma relação com a natureza diferente. E por isso é que nós encontramos nos jovens, hoje em dia, uma muito maior abertura às causas, aos desígnios, à, à proteção da natureza que nós tínhamos, pelo menos na minha geração. E é um pouco quase como que por um instinto de sobrevivência, por uma questão existencialista, que eu acho que a espécie humana vai ter de ser muito mais frugal e vai ter de conceber a sua relação no futuro de uma maneira muito mais espartana na relação com os bens materiais. Take one example of automobiles. There is no sensible reason why the external shape of our cars should change every 12 months. These devices could be designed to last a long time. They can be designed to be disassembled more easily. It could be designed in a way where we don't own cars at all, because in a world of robotic cars, you just call up a vehicle when you need it. Those are the kind of choices that we're going to need to make as societies. In 2077, airplanes are supersonic and trains are the true time capsules exceeding 1,000 kilometers per hour. Thousands of millions of hidden and silent chips monitor traffic. Cars have long answered our summoning and drive themselves on land and in the air. Combustion engines are part of a distant past. You know, a hundred years ago, Henry Ford and Thomas Edison were friends, but rivals, and they made a bet. What will energize cars of the future? Will it be the electric battery or will it be gasoline? People said, ha, the answer is easy. It'll be electric because gasoline, it explodes. People will die in gasoline fired cars. Plus you can have a gasoline station in every block. People laughed. Well, who had the last laugh? Of course, Henry Ford. But eventually, who will have the last laugh? I think Thomas Edison because batteries will become more efficient cheaper, 
and the future belongs to electric cars and to hydrogen cars. Com os transportes aéreos coletivos, abandonámos as filas de automóveis no solo. Ganhei tempo. Ganhamos tempo. And yes, we'll have flying cars. They're going to be expensive, but we will have cars that will fly. Electric engines are going to be a big deal. And that's what's made the drone revolution possible. And one can see several paths towards flying vehicles. The obvious one at the moment is you keep making existing drone technology larger and large enough to carry humans. Quizás estas ciudades que surgen de la naturaleza van a ser algo que vamos a ver más y más y más en esta imagen del futuro. Así que ahí me quedo con esa imagen de Julio Verne, de estas ciudades que colgaban de los árboles. Quizás es algo que va a pasar y que va a acomodar parte de este, de este acelerado crecimiento que veremos hacia adelante. Dematerializing without increasing energy consumption is another challenge that lies ahead. At the same time as they are going to interconnect with the vast universe of the Internet of Things, more efficient and autonomous buildings capable of harnessing water and renewable energies are expected. Nanotechnology will enable metamorphosis and explosion of new materials, and 3D printing will open the door to easily adaptable spaces. La tecnología cada vez va a entrar más en nuestros cuerpos y también en nuestras edificaciones. We will get to see in our lifetime uh, printers that, that make, uh, can print houses. They'll have much more organic shapes because it's easier to print. But I can imagine in 10, 20 years that you literally just design your house all digitally with all the different materials and, and all the, the furniture, everything you want inside. And you basically put this very advanced manufacturing robot onto the place where you want your house and it just starts feeding in the different materials and starts constructing this house. A humanidade está hoje em permanente movimento. Mais da metade da população de cidades como Oslo, Berlim e Nova York são migrantes. At the beginning of the 20th century, humanity began a journey towards the cities that will intensify in the coming decades. Today, half of the world population is concentrated in the major cities, but by 2077, this number will have doubled. It means that there will be as many people in cities as today's world population. If 100 years ago there were two cities with more than one million inhabitants, in 2077, there will be megalopolises with more than 100 million people. As cidades vão ter um papel essencial porque as cidades vão ser o ponto fulcral da ciência e da inovação. Ou seja, estamos a passar do estado nação para a cidade nação. O saber como densificar corretamente as cidades e ter uma planificação há muitos anos deveria ser a maneira de antecipar-se a estes desafios. El gran problema es que los gobiernos duran muy poco. Los gobiernos se preocupan, pues, por lo general, de las cosas que van a pasar en el corto plazo. Or, la ville a été un immense facteur d'émancipation pour l'humanité. Mais aujourd'hui, il y a une telle accumulation urbaine sur tous les continents, avec de très nombreuses villes qui font 10, 15, 20 millions d'habitants, qui fait que la ville n'est plus le symbole de la libération, mais devient une nouvelle tyrannie. Et donc, le problème sera d'aborder la question de la régulation des villes et de retrouver un équilibre entre les villes et les campagnes. Donc le défi est comment tu peux assurer ce type de développement sustentable en mettant le correct niveau de uso, mais aussi en adaptant à ce qui a été toujours. À mon avis, à grands rasgos, ce qui peut produire des villes plus sustentables. Et non seulement du point de vue du manejo du climat, du manejo de l'énergie, mais aussi une sustentabilité qui a à voir avec le social como con lo económico. Yo creo que el problema de los guetos en relación a la migración es una de las principales amenazas hacia el futuro. We have arrived at a development paradox. 
On the one hand, we have technological possibilities like never before at our disposal. On the other hand, we have an increase of imbalances and asymmetries. 1% of the world's population has as much as the remaining 99%. In the future, the constraints of climate change may heighten inequalities. De facto, a evolução tecnológica e a globalização, que tiveram efeitos extremamente positivos na, no crescimento da riqueza, na diminuição do número de pobres absolutos, na melhoria das condições de vida, na, 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 na saúde, no tempo de vida, também tiveram consequências negativas. E uma das consequências negativas foi o aumento das desigualdades. As oito pessoas mais ricas do mundo, são aliás oito homens, têm tanto quanto metade da humanidade, a metade mais pobre da humanidade. Portanto, isto dá de facto uma ideia da enorme desigualdade que se gerou com todas as frustrações e com todos os problemas que isso causa à escala global. The Anthropocene is also called, it's the age of climate change. It's the age of enormous financial economic inequalities. People call it the capitalocene and they also call it the obscene in terms of the differences in, in, in our chances of survival. Notre système de capitaliste qui est en train de détruire la planète, c'est ce qui fait, c'est ce qui paye les écoles, c'est ce qui paye les routes, c'est ce qui paye les hôpitaux. Donc je, 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 pas, on n'a pas trouvé le système encore. Whatever your question is, capitalism gives you the answer. Go shopping. Whatever the question is, nothing that a good pair of shoes can't solve. And so commodity fetishism has been capitalism answer to our desire, replacing serious um, answers we just consume and get on with it and so we have centuries of this but we also have centuries of critical theory that helps us read this c'est vrai que disons que la grande tragédie des 30 dernières années si vous voulez c'est qu'on a tous cru que la chute du communisme c'était le début de la mondialisation et que le début de la mondialisation c'était la démocratie en fait non c'était l'extension du capitalisme au niveau mondial mais le capitalisme mondial c'est pas la démocratie mondiale Il n'y a aucun rapport. Maybe at this point in our history, what we need to do is look at what we desire, how the social construction of desires is actually threatening our future. And if we continue to desire progress, and if we continue to desire more wealth, and, and we see that it isn't coming, because in a world where the organization of wealth is 1% versus 99%, and it's quite obvious that our students are beginning to understand that they will not be as well off as their parents, let alone better. The idea that every generation gets better, maybe we should have the, 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 the truth, the courage to say, that's finished, it's, it hurts, it's not the end of the world if we reorganize the distribution of resources. About we start desiring poverty? How about we start desiring zero growth? How about the object of our desire is clean air? How about water that doesn't come out of bottles, comes out of beautifully clean fountains, which have all been contaminated across Europe in the last 20 years? How about desiring ecological sustainability? How about desiring peace? Il faut réguler politiquement la mondialisation économique pour réduire les inégalités, il va falloir penser la démocratie pour à la fois qu'elle reste une valeur universelle et qu'en même temps elle respecte la diversité culturelle. So I would see, a, I would imagine quite a collective discussion and again the only forces that do this in the world are the religious ones and the rest of the political class is doing, what is the left doing? about the future. Um, what are the trade unions doing on pensions? Um, pensions which only protect my generation. They do nothing for the, for the young ones. Um, it's a racket. Um, and if you touch the unions, and I'm a woman of the left, the sky falls because we touch the holy unions. Um, there are simply cartels protecting one generation and sacrificing the next ones um, to the altar. Um, of, of an improbable future. Mas acho que temos que lutar 
para que uh, os frutos que esta evolução tecnológica põe à nossa disposição possam ser distribuídos de forma equitativa uh, e possam beneficiar uh, as comunidades por todo o mundo. By the mid-21st century, more than half of the jobs will be overtaken by machines. In China, it is estimated to be more than 70%. Is robotization a threat or an opportunity to reform our economic and social model? The question of whether machines are stealing jobs is really not a productive question. Machines have replaced jobs forever, but on balance we've created more jobs than we've replaced. And anybody worried about this issue would really do well to go back and start by reading Keynes and then ask yourself, are we having the same stupid conversation today? It's not about work, it's about meaning. Where do we get the meaning in our lives? Where do we get the income to live our lives? What sort of economy do we wish to have? And the technology has created the possibility that we can completely restructure that in ways that benefits everyone. And universal basic income is one interesting proposal being put up. And there are seven, eight, or so really interesting experiments globally happening right now. Maybe in five years we can work less because of technology. In 10 or 20 years we may be working three or four hours a day and get paid the same because of technology. Right? And maybe in 30 years we get paid without working. Like the uh, basic income guarantee, you know, the, the idea of paying everybody a salary regardless of work. Right? Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize for Economics, says financially it would work. It's legally and, and politically that this goodwill will never be extended, but it would be an evolutionary step towards a collaborative view of the future, not the 1% and the 99%, but a new form of global social democracy. Os robôs vão substituir muito o nosso trabalho braçal. E a gente não pode inventar trabalho. O, o trabalho que nós vamos ter daqui a umas décadas é sobretudo o trabalho social para que os, os velhinhos tenham condições para não se sentirem totalmente marginalizados. Vamos ter bisavós e vamos ter trisavós, não se esqueça. Como é que a sociedade se vai organizar? On the one hand, people will travel more and more prepared to work and live anywhere. On the other hand, a figure five times higher than the total number of refugees that exist today will most likely have to abandon their lands, leading to the greatest migratory movement in history. Climate change will displace three to ten times more than conflicts or wars, which means a billion people are expected to be displaced by mid-century. The state was created to protect the sedentary people from the nomadic invasions, but it may collapse in the future precisely for the same reason. 10,000 years after we became sedentary, are we at risk of returning to nomadism? Well, we're already become more nomadic. We're going to see even greater movements of populations around the planet than we've, we've seen today. And that in turn has the social implications of when children live half a world away from their parents, how do those social networks work? Of course, you can have electronic proximity, but how do people actually find stability amidst all this choice is going to be one of the great social challenges.
até por razões demográficas, nós precisamos de migrantes. Na Europa, todos os idosos são, em larga medida, apoiados por imigrantes que vieram para a Europa. Ou seja, as migrações são necessárias. E se são necessárias, é melhor organizá-las. Mais que vê-lo como um problema, vê-lo como uma oportunidade. Nós temos experiências em que se pusermos grupos de pessoas a escrever ou na ciência e artigos científicos ou a inovar, quando há diversidade de género, quando há diversidade de religião, quando há diversidade de maneiras de pensar e de geografias, essas pessoas produzem em média 30% mais do que os grupos homogéneos. So the world is mixing up and, and changing. One example in Europe, 50 years ago, 75% of all Christians lived in Europe. Today, 75% of all Christians live outside of Europe. Demographically, Europe is shrinking. They're only having one ch child per woman. But in the rest of the world, they're having uh, two, three, or more children per woman. So the world's religious population will outgrow the non-religious population. Today, uh, eight in 10 people around the world have a religion, but we expect that number to get closer to nine in 10 people in the future. We see the future of religion to be demographically uh, overpowering, you could say. Islam is uh, growing faster than other religions because uh, there are more children being born to Muslim women. The world gets more modern. Muslim women, just like women all over the world, are having fewer children. So what we expect in the future is to have the Muslim population grow to a certain point, uh, and by about 2050, before 2077, uh, that they will almost reach the same number of Christians. L'individu apparaît de plus en plus comme celui qui doit administrer, gouverner sa propre existence. Je ne vois pas comment cela pourrait reculer. Cette hyper-individualisation, elle a aussi comme corréla des nouvelles formes de vie collective que nous n'aimons pas et qui paraissent aller à contre-courant de cet individualisme. Ces deux phénomènes iront croissant. Je crois que nous allons avoir des majorités tranquilles et des minorités dangereuses. Over the past decade, uh, government restrictions on religion and social hostilities involving religion, such as terrorism or hate crimes or uh, other types of violence, uh, either towards religious people or done by religious people, has been growing. So today, about 75% of the world's people live in a country with high restrictions coming from governments or from groups in society. What this uh, does is it creates a situation that's both uh, not good for social cohesion, but also an environment where sustainable business cannot grow. Where there's conflict, it's only good for bullet and bomb business. It's clear that if people embrace religious freedom and interfaith understanding, there'll be more peace. If people use religion as a source of division and conflict, uh, then we would look at a future with more conflict. Eu acho que se torna claro que é necessária uma resposta internacional coordenada para que as pessoas tenham oportunidades para poder viver e ter futuro nos seus países, para que as migrações sejam uma questão de opção, não uma necessidade de sobrevivência. Que, que tu vis dans un pays où il n'y a pas de démocratie, il n'y a pas de système de santé, il n'y a pas de travail, il n'y a pas d'éducation. Tu n'as pas beaucoup d'autres choix que de venir dans, dans ce paradis qu'on représente, que tu sais toi par internet combien est le salaire moyen, tu sais, et comme tu veux une meilleure vie pour tes enfants, tu veux une meilleure vie pour toi, et comment est-ce que le, ce paradis va pouvoir recevoir tout ce monde Ça, à mon avis, c'est un des grands, grands, grands problèmes de notre civilisation qu'on n'a pas encore compris. Refugees don't grow on trees. They respond to wars. The primary source of refugees is war. So the real question is where will the wars take place and how will they expand?
Quem manda no espaço, manda no mundo. A partir de bases lunares secretas e plataformas espaciais estratégicas, são comandados ataques com mísseis 10 vezes mais rápidos do que o som. Aviões hipersónicos não tripulados são armas poderosas. 100 anos depois do lançamento da bomba atômica, os Estados Unidos veem uma nova guerra em uma escala global. Hoje, há 10 países com armas nucleares. Em 2077, há mais de 20, quase em todas as áreas de grande política e instabilidade. Se há armas currentes suficientes no mundo para ser destruídas várias vezes, em 2077, nós teremos cinco vezes essa capacidade militar. Nanotecnology will open doors to an infinite, minuscule new world in which thousands of nanoships will patrol space, the new war stage. Energy will continue to play a strategic role in the new global order. The more energetically sustainable the nations, the less likely it is for international conflicts to break out. I think what we are in for, for the next phase is the de decline of the great powers of the 20th century. Russia, China, Germany. I think we will see in the long run the emergence of a very different Europe, still one of the centers of human existence. I see Europe's periphery having its moment. In the same way that I see Eurasia's margins, Poland, Turkey, Japan, that certainly we will see conflict in the next the century. Because you don't have declines of countries like Germany, Russia, China, and the rise of countries like Japan, Turkey, and Poland without conflict. I would be surprised if we didn't have some major conflict come out of nowhere in the next decade or two. War is one of the most constant things in human existence. It is an unpleasant truth, but will there be a war? Of course. This will not be the first century not to have a war. Space has become the center of a great many near conflict things. Where we go, war goes, and certainly already war has entered space. Some people say that technology has given us weapons. Take a look at World War I. They gave us poison gas, they gave us the machine gun. Take a look at World War II. They gave us intercontinental missiles and bombers and of course the atomic bomb. But you see, these leaps have been leaps in energy. Chemical energy in the form of machine guns, nuclear energy in the form of the atomic bomb, and I'm a physicist. I know that the next energy level beyond that is going to be cosmic. That is the energy of the Big Bang, the energy of gravity, the energy of the universe. And we're, we're millennia away from being able to harness any of that energy. And so in other words, the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb will be the most powerful weapons for perhaps thousands of years to come. It is of course a concern, but we have to, have to, have to ask a different question. Why has no nation used nuclear weapons in the 70 years, except the United States, in, in the 70 years between its invention. Is this simply luck, or is there something in the nature of nuclear weapons that makes it very difficult to use? When we go to war, the people sitting around the table in the cabinet room don't expect to die. If they nu use nuclear weapons, they can expect to die. Nuclear weapons create a threshold, and even Kim Jong-un, crazy as he is, uh, is going to be, think twice before using nuclear weapons, because 15 minutes later he dies. E nós tivemos à beira de guerras nucleares no século XX. Aliás, hoje sabe-se que em certos momentos foi por um triz que a guerra nuclear foi evitada. Há hoje uh, um risco efetivo de que o que foi conseguido em matéria de não proliferação seja posto em causa. Uh, e esse risco existe, mas também existe a possibilidade de que isso seja evitado.
What happens when you have small little weapons that are maybe this big and intelligent? Yes, that is a problem. But these weapons are not going to destroy nations overnight like an atomic bomb. So yes, there is a change in the nature of warfare. It is not going away. But the American age has built an efficiency into warfare that is no longer total war. The Americans revolutionized the weapons by making them intelligent, or at least sufficiently intelligent to know what the target is and guide themselves. These are tools to make war more difficult, not easier. Now, of course, you can always make mistakes, but uh, so far in, in, in the 21st century, I think we're seeing the, the technology that's being developed of nanorobots and, and other uh, things that, that are military that are actually making it easier to keep the peace. Let's do a science experiment. Take a sheet of paper and write down every single war you studied since you were a child. And then ask yourself a simple question. How many of them were between democracies? And you realize, none. History has shown us that once a nation becomes democratic, it's subject to all the debates and moral dilemmas of a democracy. And two democracies never war with each other. And you realize that all of them have between kings, queens, dictators, and emperors, never between two democracies. And so I think that as the internet spreads knowledge, it spreads democracy, and democracies do not war with other democracies. Now, we will have wars in the future. I think that the second half of the century will be a golden age. In the same way that the period from World War II until 2008 was a golden age. It was a period of limited war, enormous economic growth, substantial advances in civilizations. We will see that again in 2050. So I would say there are two hypotheses if we take 50 years distance. L'ONU, la seule organisation mondiale pour la paix et la guerre, optimiste, prend du pouvoir. On arrive à régler les grands conflits en Afrique, en Asie, et on donne plus d'importance à la régulation politique, à la reconnaissance de la diversité culturelle, à la tolérance. Et donc on arrive à un monde qui n'est pas forcément démocratique, mais dans lequel il y a moins de guerres religieuses, d'identité et de haine. Ça, c'est la vision optimiste. La vision pessimiste, l'ONU n'arrive pas à être le gendarme démocratique du monde, Et à ce moment-là, les technologies d'information dont est un tel réseau deviennent des accélérateurs de haine. Les peuples se referment sur eux, le nationalisme l'emporte, le communautarisme aussi, et les conflits se multiplient dans tous les sens. Et à ce moment-là, vous avez des conflits mondiaux sur des bases ethniques, culturelles ou religieuses ou identitaires. My grandchildren will grow up in the middle of the century and face the same thing their parents did. And their children will, I think, face that mid-century war that I th hope they will live through. They will grow up in a difficult, difficult time like the 1970s, like the 1930s. But a great deal in this country depends on what they do, not what society does. So here is the great difference between Europe and the United States. In Europe, you're all caught up together and you move the flow. In the United States, you break free of the together and make your own life. Europe will have the most massive change, which is that the institution they invented cannot survive. The European Union no longer is functioning. But Europe itself is going to be a very prosperous and important place. O projeto da União Europeia é um projeto que foi construído de uma maneira que o tornou irreversível. Vai ter muitos altos e baixos, vai. Uh, que nós sobrevivemos nos últimos 10 anos as maiores crises que alguma vez vivemos depois da Segunda Guerra Mundial, porque foi a crise financeira dos refugiados, do terrorismo, do Brexit. Tudo isto ao mesmo tempo e a Europa sobreviveu. Uau! Para mim, uma situação extraordinária. 
c'est la construction politique de l'Europe. L'Europe, aujourd'hui, c'est 500 millions d'habitants, 26 langues, 27 pays. Tout le monde se déteste. Personne n'a rien à se dire. On est toujours dans des contentions entre les Européens. On dit toujours que l'Europe va, va se détruire tous les six mois. Et ça tient. Et ça tient depuis 60 ans. Donc s'il y a une utopie politique extraordinaire dans l'histoire du monde, c'est l'Europe. Vivemos um momento tão perigoso. Eu penso que a 60 anos sou mais otimista do que a dois anos. O maior desafio do 21 e siglo é aprender a coabitar e aprender a se tolerar quando não se compreende e quando não se ama. E isso é um objetivo político. Político no sentido de uma grande política. Em 2077, eu imagino um bom grupo de radical vozes que critiquem. The society, the government, the media, uh, radical voices, it's part of the democratic process. Um, we need them and we need to teach people um, uh, to have the courage to, to be critical, to be radical. In this brutal new world order, we need to use our technology to say, actually, I disagree. Um, actually, I don't see it like that. And actually, I have arguments. Um, si on veut que l'homme s'améliore, alors c'est une question politique. Politique, morale, d'éducation, jamais technique. Le plus compliqué, c'est l'homme. Et donc la question, c'est de laisser la, te la technique à la place et de réfléchir à la vraie question. Comment faire que l'homme soit moins égoïste, moins pervers, moins méchant, moins agressif Ça, c'est beaucoup plus difficile. Acho que nós temos revelado sempre uma enorme capacidade para criar problemas, mas também uma enorme capacidade para resolver. É isso que espero que no futuro esse equilíbrio se mantenha. Há várias variables as well as chances for both success and failure. Maybe we will achieve a new world order, respecting and accepting differences. Or maybe we will face each other in a clash of civilizations. If we can rid ourselves of fossil fuels, contain war and mitigate the collateral damage of the new nomadism, we will open the door to a brave new world. It all depends on where we want to go and at what cost. What do we want humanity to be? Para viajar é necessário deixar como garantia bens pessoais ou informações pormenorizadas da vida privada. Somos vigiados 365 dias por ano. A liberdade tem hoje um sentido perverso. Este é o tempo de todas as possibilidades. O tempo da hipervigilância e da ubiquidade nómada. O tempo do previsível e do surpreendente. O tempo da evolução exponencial e da repetição da história. <SILENCIO>